That's right, it's The Observer. And we're now speaking to author, researcher, and media presenter and the chairman of the Black Agenda Project, Dr. David Muhammad. Pleasant good evening, sir. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to The Observer once again. Wa alaikum salam. Good evening, Brother Mikey K. And good evening to all the viewers and listeners. Uh, Dr. Wad, so much is being said, especially as far as the stereotyping and the labeling. But going back to a newspaper article in, from 2020, it says that young black males are the main perpetrators of murders. According to data from the Crime and Problem Analysis Branch of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, for the period 2015 to 2019, a total of 510 persons were charged with murder. Of this figure, 490 were males and 90 were females. The statistics show that with respect to ethnicity, 342 were Afro-Trinidadians and 107 Indo-Trinidadians. The majority of the persons charged with murders, 317, were persons ranging between 15 to 29 years of age. Uh, and of course, you know, this is presented and people say, listen, that's it. it. It's labeled that way. And, and we also have informal social laws. And, and, and these, these things, of course, come across so stereotypical that you have people say, listen, if they dress a particular way, then they're dangerous. If they live in a certain area, they're dangerous. If they listen to certain music, they're dangerous. Why? Yeah. Well, once again, thanks for the opportunity to be able to address um, some of these issues. Now, in science, and in this case, we're looking at social science, in order to properly understand any phenomena, we must explore and examine the law of cause and effect. Because for every effect, there is a cause. And for every observable event or occurrence, there's a reason behind its existence. So what is misleading is when we look at the end product of a chain of events and then see the end product itself as the complete reality. So the end product that we see are, yes, so many young black males as the faces, the mascots for a lot of these crimes that are being committed. So many feel the solution is to put them in jail or to execute them, bring back the handgun, etc. But if those lines of solutions are pursued, then we will find that the problem would not improve, it would just keep getting worse and worse because we've only cut off the tail end of the situation while we have left the causal factors or the ingredients that produce them to continue to flourish. So if, for example, the cause behind these crimes are dysfunctional families, educational underachievement, negative peer group influences, and the high proliferation of guns, drugs, and illegal narcotics and firearms, but we only incarcerate those who are caught in the possession of them but we don't do anything to try to curtail the trafficking and circulation of them, then we're going around in circles. But I do understand that there are optics behind it. All right. So if a politician makes a grand announcement in a press conference that they've just arrested so-and-so amount of people, or they've just apprehended this number of people, or they've just solved a couple of crimes or murders, it gives the public a false sense of comfort because to them, it looks as if something is being done. But if at the tail end of that chain, if at the beginning of it, we're not cracking down on the white collar crime that is responsible in many instances for the law of cause and effect in a lot of these matters, this is why it keeps getting worse. And this is why we would have went from a murder rate of 300 and something to 400 and something to 500 and something, now 600 and something even though so many people are being killed, so many people who are believed to be lawbreakers, offenders and criminals, they're going to jail, they're being executed. But yet still the problem is still persisting. So clearly the cause of the situation is not those who are being apprehended, arrested, imprisoned and killed, 
but it's something much bigger than and, that. And, and I want to agree with you on that. And, and not only the end effect, but there all there has to be some sort of historical component as well. I mean, the mere fact that it, it's it's a feeling of fear, that fear factor when you see a young black male. And this hasn't happened now. We're talking about, let's look at that historical component. Because if you look back in history to the genesis of these many stereotypes, out of fear of the rebellious slaves, slave owners would propagate that if slaves were to escape, they would rape the innocent and pure white woman. And we're not talking about something that they would do, you know. It's something that has been embedded in the psyche of people that these people are dangerous. These young black males seem to be the symbol for all the wrongdoings and destroying everything that is good in society. Why is that fear factor so strong and why does it still exist today? And you know, interestingly, Mikey K, just, um, just a couple weeks ago or less, the um, foreign secretary, like the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the government of England, a uh, lady by the name of Suella Braverman. She, in speaking about cracking down on one particular crime, she mentioned that this is on like some um, human trafficking crime. She mentioned that the main victims were English white girls. And she got a lot of, obviously, you know, a lot of negative reactions for that statement that came across as racist. But the awkward thing about it is she is of East Indian descent. And the new prime minister is also of East Indian descent. But there has been this very aggressive crackdown on immigration, in particular from Asia and Africa. Now, when it comes to crime in a multicultural, multi-ethnic, cosmopolitan society, there are always these fear factors and scapegoating that take place to terrify one segment of the population in fear and xenophobia for another segment of the population. And then they fixate their attention on not solving the crime, but solving the presence of the people. Uh, this is where you get that barrage of responses, for example, when there's an extrajudicial killing. But I had made the narrative recently about, and this is reactionary in response to statements that were made, now infamous by the pundit who had highlighted that black youth, mainly urban youth, are responsible um, for crime. In response to that, I didn't just volunteer the narrative out of a vacuum, but in response to that, I pointed out that if you take the top 10 or maybe even the top 20 list of the biggest criminals in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. Chances are not even one of them would be of African descent. It's possible that even if you take the top 50 biggest criminals in the history of this nation, it's possible that none of them would be African people. But at the same time, when you think of the prison, when you think of the jails, when you think of arrests by police officers, when you think of gang members shooting and drug selling, images of black youth come to mind. Yeah. And again, it is the over-sensationalization of that end product of the crime situation. And so I mentioned persons such as Boise Singh, who is the first, and to my knowledge, the only serial killer that this country has ever had. You yeah. had Rafiq Puna Muhammad, you had Teddy Mice, you had Nayam Naya, who, according to the Scott Drug Report, had a number of police officers receiving a salary of $50,000 per month. You had Nankisun Gutram, Dole Chedi. These are persons who had criminal empires so huge that they employed family members who employed other family members, and they had judges, magistrates, senior police officers, customs, and immigration officers on their payroll. Now, all of them, with the exception of Boise Singh, would have also had a number of young African people employed by them to do some of their dirty work. Yeah. But those are the ones who would have went to prison while they, the crime lords and bosses, would have stayed out of jail. Exactly. And then we are the ones who get the reputation. Exactly, and we have that social perception. And, and, and again, uh, there are people who would say, listen, but David, at the end of the day, those people did not really and truly, you know, we didn't get across paths with those people. We're talking about individuals 
who are jumping our walls, coming into our homes, violating yeah. our families. And what we are seeing here, we're seeing young black males. Now, if you put that in perspective, perspective as far as what you're seeing um, at the end effect, when you look at the top of that chain, when someone is defined as a gangster, you look that, that person comes across in your mind, your psyche, as, as someone who's heartless. They wouldn't think twice about snuffing out your life. But what about the gangsters in real estate? What about the, the gangsters in banking? What about the, the, the gangsters in, in many other aspects, in insurance, and all of these other things? They don't get that, sta that same stereotyping, where you have people who would say, listen, don't hire these young black men. They will come back and rob the business. If you're opening up your business, make sure them so don't come in. If you invite them, they will shoot up the place. And if you're going to be anywhere in their area, perhaps you need to wear a bulletproof vest. Now, this may come across as just conversation in passing, but embedded in the psyche of many, that type of ignorance thrives to the, fact, to the point where they believe that it's real. Right. And remember, a lot of the education that we receive is through what is called social learning, which is when we both consciously and subconsciously ingest images on television screens, film, footage from phone and tablet screens. We get messages, repetition, and songs through the culture. And we are constantly bombarded, both knowingly and unknowingly, with a series of messages, each of which have a different psychological impact on the nature and trend of our thought process. So we are surrounded. Sometimes we don't even know where we got certain opinions from. Sometimes we ourselves are not even aware of the opinions and views that we would have about certain kinds of things and people. So we have to protect our minds. But you know, Mikey K, I say all of that to say that the Boys Academy, the George Padmore Boys Academy that we are running at the Kwame Toure Center, I see it as part of our responsibility to protect the mind of those young people from these kinds of narratives. Because in educational psychology, one of the most impacting theories is that of the self-fulfilling prophecy, whereby, particularly with a young person, if they are convinced that there are specific expectations of them to fail, to not do well in school or drop out, to join a gang, to commit crimes, to start taking drugs and drinking alcohol at a very young age and engaging in juvenile delinquency, if a young child is convinced that those are the community and environmental expectations of them, then this increases the possibility, the probability for them to act out in fulfillment of those expectations. And our young children in the communities are bombarded with those negative attitudes. You have audio recordings of school teachers telling children how stupid they are, how dense they are, how they'll never get anywhere in life, how their parents are failures. And sometimes by the time they get to the age of 10, there's so much negativity that they've been exposed to. And to hear that narrative coming out of television that these urban young black youth are the ones solely responsible for crime in the country, we, in doing our part, have to protect the minds of those young children. And this is why in addition to the traditional academic subjects that we may teach at the Kwame Ture Center, we make it a priority to teach black history, the African achievements and accomplishments of our ancestors and all that they were able to do at the towns and cities and civilizations and science and technology that they were able to contribute so that our young men can have a more positive perception of who they are and that is the groundwork foundation for them to do better and be successful in their future. Oh, wonderful. We just got a few seconds again. Your closing comments, go right ahead. Well, I have always taken the position that in this current crime crisis, as it exists, everyone has their part. All of us. And I believe if everyone takes their job seriously enough, the professionals in all these different fields of human endeavor, if we all look out for the youth, look out for the young people, and do whatever we can 
to fight against the crime situation from all fronts. It's not just the national security issue. It's a family life issue. It needs male mentorship. It's an educational issue. It's also an economic issue because poverty and unemployment create a void or a gap opening where someone may want to resort to criminal behavior. It's a positive role models and peer group influence issue as well. So it covers so many dimensions and each and every single one must have our part that we must play. Thank you so much. All the best to you and your team and keep up the good work at the Kwame Touré Center. And, and likewise to you. Thank you so much. Take care.